Welcome back to Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And it is myself, Daniel Hallen. Before we get to our Halloween Crimes episode, we want to let you know of a big decision and a big opportunity. So we noticed an important event coming up that we think is too good to miss. Unfortunately, though, it does come with a cost. CrimeCon will be in Orlando, Florida in one year. What better place to record the final episode of Crime After Crime than with a bunch of our closest fans in the state that gave us some of the best stories ever, including our Florida man and Florida woman anniversary specials. So in one year, we want you guys to come and meet up with us for the big Crime After Crime Florida finale. More details will be coming in future episodes about how you can be a part of the final show. But for the final year, we're also bringing out the big guns. Yes, we are. This season, we're going to do a mix of new topics and new stories based on the best topics that we've done previously. So Danielle, she's going to pick her favorite topic. I'm going to pick my favorite topic, but then we need some help. We need you to pick your top three from the remaining topics left. So two, if you go look at the list, you're going to say, mm -hmm. hey, wait, two big topics are missing. Yeah, because Danielle picked one and I picked one. Danielle, which one did you pick? All right. I had no choice, okay? I had to pick most bizarre weapon. Uh, we have to, right? It's just the OG, you know, <laughs> that was such a great episode. Fantastic. It's one of those that not even just because it was the first episode, just it was such a great way to start off. I'm also curious just to see because like our skills have kind of developed yeah. as we've gone on <laughs> with the show. So I'm curious yeah. to see like what types of stories we find, how the tone might be a little different. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really, really curious to see how that one shakes out. I think that's an amazing selection. And honestly, like whenever people see us at crime con or something That's like always what they bring up first most yeah most bizarre weapon always comes up there's even a shirt that said choose your weapon right someone made a, a crime after crime shirt with it it was fantastic that's right uh after a lot of very careful consideration i picked black friday crimes just as soon as i hit that topic it took me to such a happy place <laughs> <laughs> i was like we got to go back this is it. This is what we're looking forward to. Yeah. I know. It's going to be fantastic. I'm excited. But of course, ending in Florida, we have to end with, you guessed it, another Florida crime show. All right. All right. So effectively, this next season, we've got, I guess it's five throwback mm -hmm. episodes. Yep. And then ultimately, well... I guess it's six throwbacks if you include the Florida one, but that's, it's not yeah. going to be Florida, Florida man or Florida woman. We're just going to open it up to Florida crimes. Which y'all, there's no telling. <laughs> oh, uh, I it's have no idea. It's a big old can of worms. It really is. <laughs> and I, and the show is going to be 15 hours long. Did I mention? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, this will be a 24 hour episode. <laughs> yeah. So the Florida finale is coming up in one year. But before that, we need your help to make sure that this is the best season ever. Head over to CrimeAfterCrimePodcast.com and vote for your top three topics so that we can make this the best season yet. It's time right now for us to talk about last episode. Let's get the results on petty crimes. Danielle told the story of one of the craziest revenge plots that I've ever heard of involving cops and criminals conspiring about drugs and vacations. And I told the story of a man who went on a fire bombing rampage over being refused a bathroom and free Starbucks Frappuccinos. How did it all play out, Danielle? All right, you guys. So on Twitter, I received 62% of the votes and John received 38%. Woo! Nice. And we'll just hit the repeat button on the website poll. I still received 62% and John received 38. Has that ever happened before either? Uh, Where it's like it, exact? No, I don't know that it's been. It, it might have been once or twice, but it's not very common for it to be that exact. Yeah, it's usually off a little bit just by a, per, a percent or two. But um, no, Man. I guess the audience spoke and I need to hand over the crime after crime mug. Now, if you guys remember from the last episode, yeah. I had the classic mug. Uh, so I'm handing it over. And oh. whoa, wait somehow, a minute, that's a change. Yeah, somehow she has the new mug. Okay, I don't know. Hocus pocus. It's the magic of the Halloween it season. Is. We just it witnessed sure it. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good episode, though. I'm actually a little bit shocked, if I'm being quite frank with you, because oh, the level of petty, no, the level of oh. petty in your story. 
was just out of this world. Yeah, but the level of revenge in your story was so thick, conspiring with police officers, sending them on vacate. Like it was, that's insane. That it was crazy talk. It was stuff that you would expect to see mm -hmm. in fiction and then go, oh, that's not believable. But it yeah. was. Unfortunately, um, unfortunately, yeah. welcome. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Crime After Crime. I was going to say, welcome to Crime After Crime. <laughs> <laughs> uh, today, we're looking into Halloween crimes. Will we be telling stories about people poisoning candy? Probably not, John. No? Believe it or not, according to USA Today, a criminal justice professor at the University of Delaware went looking for any substantiated report of a child being injured by an object or drug being planted in their Halloween candy by a stranger, and he couldn't find one. Literally not a single instance. Hmm. But I've been hearing about that my whole life. Me too. <laughs> like actual <laughs> nightmares. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He did, however, <laughs> find one instance of poisoned Halloween candy back in the 1970s. However, in that instance, it turned out to be done by a family member. Ugh. Other than that, all these photos that you're seeing on social media of, you know, razor yeah. blades sticking out of your Look what's whoppers. In my <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, they're, they're very yeah. likely being done by the person taking the photo and they're doing it for attention. And of course, as a mother, especially just me being who I am, I'm going to check anything that's given to my child by a stranger, like yeah. every single thing. We don't even get out of the car on our way home since I trick or treat neighborhood hop <laughs> <laughs> and we don't, there's no candy that goes into my children until I check it. I, I, I don't think that that is a bad policy. How could that mm -hmm. ever be a bad policy? Despite the fact that we don't have any confirmed instances of it, you don't want to be the first. So no, I think that's a great not. idea. Yeah. Uh, the most common crimes, the most common crimes yes. committed, <laughs> <laughs> the most common crimes committed on Halloween are of course, driving while intoxicated, uh, podcasting while intoxicated, which might be why when common crimes, comma, 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 Co chameleon. Common <laughs> <laughs> uh, underage drinking and disorderly conduct. There's also a spike in assault, vandalism, trespassing, and theft, which is not surprising. Yeah, so we've got plenty to work with for today's episode. Let's kick it off with a case told by the amazing Danielle Hallen. All right. I keep letting you guys in on little secrets of mine <laughs> when it new, comes to Halloween. New secret. Yes, me and my hopping neighborhoods. So I feel like the day following Halloween or the days following Halloween are actually some of the best. I feel like you're either rolling in way too much candy that you or your children have gathered from trick-or-treating, okay, which, check. Mm -hmm. Or if you're like me, this is the long-awaited time to hit up all the stores for the after-Halloween candy sales. <laughs> wow, okay. Does anyone else do that? Just don't do it where I live because I'm relying on it. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, no judgment here, but once November 1st hits, I feel like the spooky and scary parts of Halloween are supposed to be over, mm -hmm. right? But on November 1st, 1988, the town of Lancaster, California woke up to something straight out of a horror movie. Mm. Now, while many people were taking down their decorations, John has have only been up for like 18 hours. That's right. <laughs> my, my decorations come down immediately. <laughs> And looking forward to the upcoming holidays, one by one, the local sheriff's department started to answer calls from concerned citizens. These citizens complained that letters that they had received in the mail were frightening them. And at first it was just a slow trickle and everyone assumed, you know, this is probably just a Halloween prank played by someone in the town. There's apparently teenagers now who decided trick-or-treating's not cool. And so they don't go anymore. So it's probably just that. But over the next few days, dozens upon dozens of calls had piled up and the citizens were no longer just concerned, but downright horrified. It seemed that all of the recipients of the letters so far had been prominent members of Lancaster. So people like doctors, dentists, lawyers, bank owners, government officials, all of them had received disturbing letters in the mail dated back to Halloween itself. And the recipients of these letters did not seem to think that this was just all some hoax or Halloween prank. So the sheriff's office finally was like, all right, we'll look into the complaints, give them a deeper look. And it really did give them a good idea of why so many residents of Lancaster were watching over their shoulders. Now, one recipient of the letter was a woman named Eileen Malukio. I think I'm pronouncing her last name right. There's some difficult last names in this. Okay. And... The letter itself was basically just pages of threats and demands. 
Eileen had been told to fork over $300,000 to this unknown writer. And the writer had leverage. So whoever was writing these letters knew intimate details about Eileen's life, like where she lived, her place of work, her routines every single day. They even knew that her husband, Nick, had recently died of a heart attack. And this is where things took an even creepier turn. The writer claimed in the letters that Nick didn't just die of a heart attack, but he had actually been poisoned. And if Eileen didn't do exactly as they said, she was going to be poisoned as well. What the heck? Exactly. I know. So you can see, though, why they're like, eh, this was sent out on Halloween, probably a prank. Sure. The entire gruesome and vulgar note went into detail, though, about what would happen to Eileen, the different ways that they planned on poisoning her, from putting poison in her toothpaste to releasing mustard gas in the home. And then the note also let her know that there was a contract out for her life if she didn't cooperate. And if it went past that, they would also come for her family. Another victim was a well-known contractor named Larry Purcell, and the writer also seemed to know intimate details about him and demanded $200,000. So at this point, authorities are beginning to collect more and more letters and review their contents, and it was all the same. The magnitude of this became pretty clear at this point. Over 260 residents had received these letters following Halloween. Each of them threatened and blackmailed. Terrible. Now, I know. So realizing how large of an operation this was and the danger that these people may be in, over six detectives were put on the case along with multiple volunteers. And they were all working around the clock to hopefully bring peace back to Lancaster because you've got such a large amount of people receiving these letters and then they're still coming in like after a few days. So I'm sure everyone else was just waiting for theirs. You know, I'm sure nobody wanted to check the mail. And so they gathered as many of the original letters as they could to begin a comparison, to try to figure something out. Now, each one had been written as a Word document, folded, stapled, and sent without an envelope. And each one had a rubber stamp pushed onto it that read confidential. Some of the letters were essentially the same, almost as like it was fill in the blank, like they just swapped out yeah like personal information meant to scare the recipients the name things like that but all of them were postmarked from mojave which was about 25 to 30 minutes away based on the language and errors within the letter they were able to figure that this likely had been written by the same person all 260 letters but how could one person know so much about these different individuals and it was incredibly personal information yeah and you're talking back in 88 like this yeah. isn't you know internet days where you can just go and you know troll well, on them and you know dig in exactly and keep in mind too that these were printed out word documents and it wasn't common at that point either for everyone to have a computer yeah yeah like at all <laughs> like mm -hmm. at all yeah that wasn't even common when i was growing up in the 90s like yeah. the computer room was a cool place to hang out at like your rich friend's house. <laughs> right, right. I'm so, I'm so serious. It was like, <laughs> that was how it was. Um, but each of these letters contained threats of contracts on the recipient's life. Again, their family members were listed off as future victims. And there were amounts of up to $600,000 being demanded. Mm. I tried to find a total from all 260 letters because I can, if only one of them, had six hundred thousand dollars. That's a lot of money. But like, if you yeah. got that on fifteen different, <laughs> there's well, no telling. And you're, I'm almost wondering if this person was playing them um, almost like lottery tickets. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I'm mm -hmm. going to send out three hundred, and one and of these hope. people, yeah, one of them well, will pay. You're right. Maybe more intricate than that. Okay. So sometimes the details became very extravagant. Even you know, saying that the letters were coming from a quote organization that had been watching this person for over a year, like just big, scary words to freak people out. Yeah. And most of the information in the letters did seem to be accurate. Accurate enough for a lot of these letter recipients to hire security, mm -hmm. stay at home altogether. And there were even two people that ended up in the hospital out of fear and the impact that it ended up having on their health. Wow. So now a lot of the information in these letters has never been released, but I'm like, I can only imagine, especially if you're a prominent member of society, yeah. Um, so authorities put all this information into a spreadsheet to hopefully start finding some sort of connection. And while most members that received the letter were like 
well-known in the community. There was no other connecting factor than that. There was nothing. But they did start to kind of see, once putting it in the spreadsheet, a plan behind it all. And it was just one gigantic elaborate scheme. So in the letters, there were instructions on how to get the demanded money in the right hands. However, usually the address given to send the money to was the address of another letter recipient. (laughs) And there was also usually more than one place to send a portion of the money. It was like dispersed in a handful of different addresses you were supposed to send it to. Right. So for example, someone would be told to mail the money out to five other addresses. And the writer of these letters would say that one of those addresses was the person who had a contract out for their life. So sending money to all five of those addresses was really the only way you could ensure that you paid off the right person to not be killed essentially. But little did they know that that money was just being passed along to five other letter recipients. And then it just started the cycle and then they would have their hands on the money and that would go to like the next five. And essentially some of that money would end back at the original recipient Mm -hmm. and it just kept them in the cycle. Like the moment they thought they were out, they were back in. So there was just this constant like checks and balances happening. And at some point the money eventually would funnel back to whoever was demanding it. But it was like, I mean, 260 people in a scheme like that where it's the money's all perfectly rotating right now. And the end of each letter would say, quote, the police cannot protect you every minute of the day, month and year. If you decide not to pay, we'll blow your brains out. So, yeah, so these people are horrified. Yeah. The plan was so ridiculously thought out and meticulous. There was such a large pool of victims. It was almost mind-blowing that someone could accomplish something like this, which really made people believe that these threats would be acted out. This was obviously not just some Halloween prank. So authorities started to try to find an address in this collection to lead them to one person that could potentially be singled out the end of this flow of money. But obviously the mastermind was a bit too smart for that. So no address was ever found. The only odd thing that they did find was that a few of the letters directed the recipients to purchase walkie talkies or like two way radios of some kind and Mm -hmm. basically bring the money to Las Vegas. So this definitely stuck out to them, but ended up leading them nowhere because only a handful of the people started to pay the money. And then once like the police really got involved, everything was stopped. Yeah. The chain and and for that to work, like. You the would chain have to has assume, to fully work. Yeah. yeah, everyone has to mm-hmm. has to participate. So if even one break in the link yeah. would stop it. So hmm. well, that also kind of to me shows the confidence this person had in the information they were threatening and blackmailing with. <laughs> yeah, it scares me, and it didn't even happen to me. I'm over here like, oh, <laughs> yeah. watch it over my shoulder. Yeah. So within three weeks of Halloween, the question of who was behind this all, all of that was still unanswered. And Lancaster is now in this massive spotlight. Local news stations, along with news stations far and wide, were covering the horror that the whole town was experiencing. And even Unsolved Mysteries jumped in to cover the case. And usually they don't cover cases that recent. But, Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about 260 creepy letters sent out on Halloween night. Yeah. Yeah. They're not passing it up. (laughs) Yeah. And... Thankfully, though, all of the exposure helped to get answers. So the whole town is talking about this, and many tips began to come forward from those around town that pointed straight to two estranged Lancaster residents. I'm going to butcher their names. (laughs) Okay. I'm just warning you now. So 27-year-old Richard Ferroni and then 28-year-old Roman McCook. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. Sounds good to me. We're going to go with it. So these men were... Obviously, a little younger. They were in tech for most of their lives. They volunteered in the media department at LAPD at one point. Um, Mm. They did a whole bunch of tech work around Lancaster, but had recently been laid off. And they were known around town as being loners. So wildly intelligent loners that apparently were also known for pranks and had even had some questionable run-ins with residents in Lancaster. So one of their former neighbors ended up coming forward to police about an incident that he had with them in October. So just prior to the letters being sent out, I guess he had gone over to their home and Roman opened the door, not so kindly because instead of being like, hey neighbor, what's going on? He opened the door with a gun. Wow, geez. 
And Roman right away tells his neighbor, you know, you have to leave. You're not welcome here. And before the neighbor left, he did manage to peek around Roman to try to see what are you so paranoid about and noticed a ton of printer paper, like a printer itself. He said you could smell like the smell of when like a printer or something has been running for a very long time. You know, that mm-hmm. like weird plasticky, like papery smell. Yeah. Um, just a bunch of odd things that were the first thing that came to his mind when news about the letters spread. So... Apart from that, a few other people ended up coming forward saying that they had overheard both Roman and Richard bragging about being the ones to write these letters. Um, I think people just made that up, if I'm being quite frank, because it turns out. It seems out, silly. I well, mean, there's it does, a lot of planning to like, okay, now let's go talk about it. Like, I don't know. Yeah. That and a closer look showed that just a week prior to Halloween, both men suddenly moved away from Lancaster to Las Vegas. Okay. Okay. But so far, there was no physical proof. However, there's a lot of strange connections going on here. Yeah. Letters wanted some of the money to be sent to Las Vegas. These guys all of a sudden moved to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. They're printing things out, you know, show up with a gun at their door, acting a little paranoid. So Unsolved Mysteries airs an episode. And the following day, just so happens to be Thanksgiving, because we're just all the holidays over here. (laughs) And... They decide to get a warrant to search the duo's new apartment in Las Vegas because this is the only possible connection they can find so far. And they hit the jackpot, all pun intended, every bit of it. So inside of the home, there was, again, a ton of printer paper, a printer itself. They ended up finding walkie-talkies in the home, which had been mentioned in the letters. And they also ended up finding a paper that Roman had written a while prior to this and matched up almost exactly to the language that was used in the letters written to all 260 residents. But the main piece of evidence that they ended up finding was a list scribbled down on a piece of paper. And this list contained dozens of names of victims in Lancaster that had been sent a letter on Halloween night. So ultimately, both men were arrested. And again, obviously, they denied it. (laughs) Sure, sure. So both men claimed that they could easily explain this all away, that they had nothing to do with this. So first and foremost, they were like, we didn't just suspiciously move to Vegas a week prior. This has everything to do with taxes. (laughs) Duh. (laughs) Okay. And not just that being their first reason. Oh, it's because of taxes. They're like, oh, well, also, by the way, we moved because our neighbor threatened us. Oh, and speaking of the neighbor, he's actually framing us. He's mm. the one that's the bad guy. Mm. So like very quickly just turns things around. So they basically said that their angry neighbor was working in cahoots with some Las Vegas businessman. And they just like threw in weird choppy details. You can yeah. find it in like newspaper clippings. It's just like they'll throw out a random fact and be like, see, I'm not guilty. They're like, oh, he was mad over a land deal. What land deal? No one has any idea, but they swear it's a thing. (laughs) And basically they were like, well, because this neighbor didn't like us and he was working with this Las Vegas man and all this went wrong, they they wanted to blame us. And so that's kind of what they claim was going on. They also said that they had an alibi. The men were apparently on the East Coast when the letters were sent. And actually, they provided phone records and receipts to prove this. Yeah, but I mean, you leave letters with someone else. You say drop these in the mail on this day. Like that's that's not enough of a oh a, yeah. A cover but they the so thought like this is yeah. it. If you read any interviews from them in the newspaper, right. they're like they're like oh, no biggie. Yeah. But obviously, that's not how it worked because it's not just a coincidence that all these connecting items are found in their home. It's not just a coincidence that the money was supposed to go to Las Vegas where they had just moved. The police knew better. So on top of all of the evidence that they found in the apartment, they also ended up finding witnesses that would testify that the men had files on each individual that was targeted. Okay. Like they had collected personal files on them. These men also apparently knew a handful of their victims Mm-hmm. Another person came forward. It was actually a coworker, and this coworker said that Ferroni specifically frequently spoke about wanting to plan the perfect crime, and specifically spoke about wanting to get even with an enemy through the mail. 
Hmm. So both of them were sent back to Lancaster to face 21 felony charges. So they were charged with mailing threatening letters, conspiracy to commit extortion, and a handful more. They were held on $250,000 bond and were facing up to eight years in prison. Now Ooh. their attorney, oh, I know it's rough. You set another fly here to <laughs> mess up my story. <laughs> No, the reality is I live on a farm, but <laughs> I like to I like to blame. <laughs> oh, <it>. really? <laughs> yeah, surprise. Um, so their attorney ended up denying. You know, he's like, "There's no physical evidence. They weren't even on this side of the country." You know, but ultimately, January of 1990, both men were found guilty and sentenced to four years in prison. All right. And despite the sending injustice, it actually just kind of left a whole lot of mystery. So. Both it is Roman, like it's yeah. overly complicated and for being like some type of criminal genius stuff. I don't know. There's this weird ego in the architecture of what you're talking about, but it doesn't seem like things are super well thought out. I don't know. There's it's a weird combination. It's almost mm -hmm. like making a giant distraction around, you know, the crime that you're trying to commit, like making all this extra noise and in there's... some way. So there's lots of conspiracies. So okay. both Roman and Richard ended up being released within three years. So they went, served their time, yeah. but they to this day had remained adamant that they played no part in the crime. So during the investigation and trial, the largest hurdle was that these men, they were in fact on the other side of the country when the letters were mailed Halloween night. Mm -hmm. This was a fact that no one was arguing, but it was acknowledged that this likely meant there was a third person involved. There we go. Now, it was speculated that the men basically went to the East Coast to create an alibi for themselves. They weren't captured. And so, you know, to many people, the person that mailed the letters, even like you just said, was just, you know, like a pawn in the grand scheme of things. Someone, oh, someone they just that, sent to do this. Yeah, it could be like someone that they thought like were being helpful. Like, mm -hmm. oh, hey, we have a bunch of letters we have to mail out tomorrow. Like, they might not even know about the plan at all. Yeah. But others believe differently. Okay. Including former mayor of Lancaster, Lou Bazogian, and he was also a victim of the letter scheme. Now, he claimed outright that he fully believes that this third mystery person is actually the real mastermind behind it all and that there was something much bigger going on here. Hmm. So, whatever was said to him in his letter and other letters that he managed to get his hands on, he believes that whoever gathered this information against all these people was someone on what he said was, quote, the inside. Someone that was very close to all these prominent members of society and government officials that had been targeted. And I mean, the level of paranoia he had after this, whatever was said to him, whatever was threatened, fully messed him up. And since this person has never been caught to this day, this person that may have dropped off the letters that could have had something to do with this, there's a lot of people that receive letters that are like, there's still someone out there to get us. Like there's still someone that could play this out. Like there's, they were still so scared afterwards. Hmm. Hmm. And so meanwhile, there's others that just believe that Roman and Richard really were the ones behind it all. While there was no like clear motive that was ever announced, there is a theory. So there's a theory that they were angry at members of Lancaster because they were part of the Antelope Valley Film Commission, okay. which I guess wasn't getting a ton of support from the Antelope Valley community. And so it's believed that they decided to get back at those who could have helped but chose not to. Kind of weak, yeah. Yeah, I think so too. But there's others that believe that this was just done simply for the thrill of it and because I, they could do it. Yeah. Because both men, I guess, have been described as having a love for dramatics. I mean, they're in media, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, they loved pranks, and a lot of people said that they had a tendency to exaggerate. They loved telling wild stories. So maybe they thought – we have nothing else to do. We got laid off of our job. Why don't we come up with an absolute insane Halloween prank that no one will forget that scares the whole town? Like the ultimate show. I think they have a good point that someone else might be driving at all of it. It'd be one thing mm -hmm. if you were hearing that um, there was details in the letters that people were just saying, oh, this is absolutely not true, you know, um, or if there was some question about the details that was coming in the letters. But Based on what you're saying, like there there was were... a little bit though. 
Okay. So, well, they were, they never gave answers. So everyone's had to just kind of figure out sure. how this information was gathered. And so it's been theorized by investigators that they were using like old newspapers, like years and years back looking in newspapers to gather things like property records, announcements, obituaries, like yeah, I mean, and you are, tree. You are talking about public people, so mm -hmm. it's going to be easier. I mean, we, we are talking about the fact there's no internet at that time, but you're right. Yeah. Like newspapers would be providing similar information in particular mm -hmm. for people in the public eye. So, um, yeah. but the thing that caught me was that you were talking about either one or both of them working at the LAPD for a while. I was mm -hmm. wondering if they had almost accessed some level of file system or something. Yep. And they're like, oh, here's some details on these public figures and then kind of got it from there. But I mean, that's the thing that kind of sucks is that they mention that when speaking about these men. But like, so to me, it seems like it could be relevant, but there's never any more explanation to it. Like, when did they work for LAPD? Like, you know, when... You know, I yeah. don't know, but I mean, still yeah. though, if you think about that, that's 260 people. Even if you're looking through old magazines and all these other things, I mean, they also had, based on some information in the letters, they had to have been physically watching these people. Right. As right. well. Yeah. Um, but there was some information that they found, for instance, that was like, they said it was outdated. Mm -hmm. So it was like old information that possibly could have been found in a newspaper, but things had changed since then. And so like they'd used old information against these people. Um, there was one instance where I think they sent the letter to like an old address. Oh, okay. okay. That could last be traced back to a newspaper, but there was some of it that no one could figure out how anyone yeah. would have gotten that information. Hmm. Weird. So it's a lot there of is work. absolutely no telling. Yeah, it's a lot of work. And yeah. so that's why I think everyone's trying to figure out for what, like why right, right. did they do this? But I don't think we'll ever know why they did it, who this third person is, and if they're even important or the truth behind any of it. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it would have come out by now. I mean, that was a while ago. Mm -hmm. hmm. But still, these people were horrified. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the ultimate Halloween prank, but like you don't know if it's a prank or not. <laughs> yeah. Well, and even after someone's charged, like imagine that. There's like zero level of closure on any of this. Yeah. Yeah. And if the old mayor is like, oh no, there's like someone still out there. Yeah. I'd be so know. interested to know like what piece of information. Obviously, I know. there's like, something what in that. What did someone have on you? <laughs> yeah. There's something in that letter that got him uh -huh. cut a little too close. Um, mm -hmm. but it, it, uh, there's an aspect of it that sounds so similar to like, you know, internet, internet scams that are going on nowadays, yep. like on the daily with regular people. Oh, but just imagine that, you know, N I'm no. already paranoid as it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I got something like that, like the day after Halloween and knew that some creepy person had sent out 260 letters in like the darkness of Halloween night. Yeah. yeah. At like a post office in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Nope. And, and the tone of the letters, off, yeah, leaving. The tone of the Ooh. letters is that you're being watched, and they know about your life. And I mean, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, that's really terrifying. Mm -hmm. mm. And like so the people too that received, like, I'm part of an organization. Yeah, right. Even what to make organization? It more, yeah, let's make it more scary. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, that's wow. terrifying. But huge thank you to um, unsolvedmysteries.com, LA Times, UPI.com archives, and medium.com for the details on that story because that was wild. That, you know, the um, scary saying that they're part of an organization might be a tell. Like there, yeah. there might be not even just a third person, there might yep. be a, a whole group that's kind of tied in. Because thinking about collecting information on a few hundred people, even it's by insane. Yeah, yeah, going to newspapers, like mm -hmm. they had to be spending a lot of time at the library. Like, I wonder mm -hmm. if investigators ever thought about that. Hey, did you guys, did you notice yep. that these guys kept coming in here? And computers, where are you going to get a computer? Library. Exactly. Well, that's like, I will say, like, that was one thing that kind of helped lead them to these guys is that there were people that were like, they have constant access to a computer and not yeah. a lot of people in the area did. Right. But they also right. told people in some letters, like, we've been working on this for a year. Like, don't try to outsmart us or outplay us. We have this planned out. We have you pinned down. Even if you're working it as a full-time job, uh, that many people, mm -hmm. you're, you're doing full research per person 
for an entire year and you they can't be working as a full-time job they've got to be doing something else around that it does sound like there's more people involved i'm mm-hmm. buying it i'm buying that see me too and yeah. i was like this has to be freaked out <laughs> yeah they got they got the chumps they got the chumps at the bottom yeah they got the yep. the, the printers but wow Interesting, Danielle. Well, you're gonna spooky stuff. Yeah, you're gonna give me something to think about for a while now, and some some of my own research to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Treat yourself this Halloween season to less time in the grocery store with HelloFresh. Need more time for decorating or finishing your kids' costumes? HelloFresh has options for 20-minute meals, low prep, and even easy cleanup meals. Take the stress out of mealtime with time-saving, no-fuss recipes ready in a snap. Or if you're looking for more family fun time, you can check out HelloFresh's limited edition kid-friendly baking kits. I don't really like baked kids. It's to bake treats with your kid's job. I don't think I'd like baked kid treats either. Oh my goodness. Well, enjoy the freshest fall flavors with HelloFresh. Every recipe includes just pick produce that travels from the farm to your door in less than a week. And HelloFresh is 72% cheaper than dining at a restaurant. Last night, I made HelloFresh's curry spiced chickpea bowl. With baked cherry tomatoes, carrots, and onions, it absolutely hit the spicy spot. Mm. Try America's number one meal kit today, but avoid the baked kits. Okay, guys, welcome back. I'm actually super excited to hear John's story because he's been hyping this up to me. Usually he's very quiet about his stories and I know nothing about it, but he keeps emailing me about it (laughs) just to tell me how excited he is. It's a good one. It's a good one, Daniel. And so I'm interested and I'm also kind of scared. You're scared? What are you scared for? If you're watching on the YouTube version, John has blacked out his side of the screen. Oh, goodness. I forgot. Here, let me uh, take care of that. <laughs> Arr, he came, he came back as a pirate. Arr, Danielle. <laughs> oh, I need a Halloween costume. Arr. <laughs> I don't have one. Yeah. I should have brought my scary mask. Well, it kind of ties into uh, my story today a little bit. Mm. But uh, Danielle, please stop staring at my hairy chest. That's uh, Eyes are up here, Danielle. Yeah. Eyes are up here. <laughs> you like that? Yes, it's fabulous. Uh, with me gold medallion. Me gold medallion. Mm-hmm. I like the braids. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. It took me a while to uh, get my hair this long and dirty enough to do this. <laughs> There we go. All right. Uh, are you ready? I'm ready. I've been waiting. You keep like dangling in front of me. I'm like, come on now. What is this story got to be about? I had to get dressed up for this one, Danielle. All right. This is The Pirate Family of Barnegat Bay, starring Thelma and Louise. Oh, good grief. That's, that's, my, that's the title for my story. Let's like get into it. this. <laughs> Barnegat Township, New Jersey hosts an annual Pirates Day Festival, complete with a costume contest, treasure hunts, fireworks, and of course, pirate reenactors like myself. This annual event celebrates a lifestyle of high adventure and high crime. Today's story is also about a type of pirate reenactment, one in a much more modern sense. It includes costumes, treasure hunts, and some fireworks, but the kind you don't see in the sky more likely over the kitchen table, all of that just in time for Halloween. Now, the identities have been changed due to the ages of some of those involved and the amazing decisions of others. (coughs) But this is all real, Daniel. So buckle up. You ready? I am, man. I'm so ready here. I've got, I always try popcorn. I like one of hot chocolate. (laughs) I'm prepared. I'm ready for the story. Excellent. Anne got married very young, and she had her first child at the age of 17, and then a pair of twins at the age of 19. Now, if three little mouths to feed wouldn't give you enough financial stress, she then went through a divorce. Thankfully, Mm -hmm. Anne would soon meet Jack. Jack was a sheetrock installer that had straightened his life out after serving three years in prison for selling cocaine. Mm. They would add to their family by having another child before tying the knot in 1996. 
another kid, another mouth to feed, but Jack also had two kids from a previous relationship, a brother who was a disabled vet that would stay with them, and a mother with one leg who would also wind up living with them. Granny was a pirate too. <laughs> about to say what on what in the Jack Sparrow? <laughs> in all, Danielle, that is eight <laughs> mouths to feed, and we're not even counting Jack and Anne. Ooh. So Anne had to get to work, but she never really found a career path for herself. She worked as a Kmart cashier. She worked at a nursing home. With both of them working, they were keeping things afloat and maybe making just a little headway. In 2000, they were able to move into a newly renovated four-bedroom home. But of course, with a new home came a mortgage payment of $1,000 per month. Now, Danielle, I don't know how you do these shows with hair like this because it always wants to get in my mouth. Yeah, it's obnoxious. This is why I don't wear lip gloss too often because it'll just like slowly stick. Oh, is that I'm what's like, happening? My I'm lip gonna gloss? I'm going to have like a, a beard. Yeah, it's your lip gloss. <laughs> <laughs> So they have this mortgage payment of a thousand a month. The payments go fine for the first year or so, but in early 2002, they start falling behind and neighbors were noticing that the house wasn't being kept up very well. The yard was littered with bicycles and toys. The windows had sheets hanging up being used as curtains. Maybe those were pirate sales. I was about to say, don't assume. That's right. It'd be a pirate sale. You never know. One neighbor said the residence was occupied by perhaps 10 to 12 people at a time, and it was a, quote, wild house with people coming and going at all hours. Another neighbor noted, this is a very good neighborhood, but we've been living in fear. Look around at the houses, then look at that one. They destroyed it. In July, Anne, then in her early 30s, filed for bankruptcy, but the real blow would come in September. Not only did her new job at a local veterinary office not work out, but Jack was hospitalized. He had congestive heart failure at the age of only 37. Whoa. Yeah. I'm almost wow. wondering about, uh, was he only selling the cocaine or maybe? Yeah. I mean, man, that is young to have that type of problem. But that sidelined him from going to work. So no more work for Jack. But somehow that wouldn't stop his dreams of becoming a bodybuilder, despite the family's financial troubles and his inability to go to work. Was, no, he gets to Las Vegas for a bodybuilding competition early in like, October. You know, and heart failure. You know, there's just a whole list here where I'm yeah. just like, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, you got to push it out, Danielle. You got to just keep going forward, man. <laughs> lift your way through <laughs> deadlift the heart problems. <laughs> anyway. As all this was going on, the mortgage company was also getting ready to foreclose on their home. Anne needed help. And not one, but two people would come to her aid. Two very unexpected people. It was the morning of Tuesday, October 29th, 2002. Anne walked around the house trying to find her 14-year-old twins. Oh, no. But they were outside. Oh, no trying to steal their stepfather's car. And they had a crazy plan for it. Jack would later say, quote, they figured if daddy goes to work, he's going to die. Let's go get the money. Luckily, Anne, Anne caught them in the act. <laughs> Danielle's terrified right now. And she's thinking, where are my kids? <laughs> how, how, how long until Raylan's 14? Look, it's not going to be Raylan. It's going to be Liam. <laughs> Okay, he's crazy. He doesn't care, man. He's going to take off on his pony any minute now. Uh oh. <laughs> Luckily, Anne catches them in the act. But as frequently happens with cases that we discuss on this show, Danielle, a decision is made. We're calling this one amazing decision number one. Okay. See, Anne doesn't stop them. Oh. She decides to go with them. She says, heck yeah, let's hop on in. And where are they going? Let's do this. About five miles away to the local Sun National Bank. Oh, no. Do they have an account there, Danielle? Something's telling me that the answer is going to be no to this. It doesn't matter if they did. Not for this plan. Jack would say, quote, <laughs> it was the children that thought this up, not her. She woke up and caught them stealing my car to do a robbery. She drove that car to make sure her kids were safe. That whatever happened to them would happen to her. Now, the court papers wouldn't identify the girls. So we're going to follow that and we're going to call them Thelma and Louise. Mm -hmm. 
The 1992 Buick Skylark pulled up to the bank, and Thelma, now wearing a black ski mask, while Louise had on a nylon, a nylon stocking pulled over her face, get out. One of them also carrying a shiny silver pistol. They walked into the bank and told everyone inside, R, this is a stick up. They didn't say R, but they did say this is a stick up. Literally thinking this was a Halloween prank. No oh, joke. No. The branch oh, manager no. says, what? Is this a joke? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, boy. One, of the, one of the twins says, no, we ain't effing joking. Insert the word for F. Give us, <laughs> give us your money. You Lobby. know, I feel like that could have gone one or two ways because someone's saying, is this a joke? Like, I feel like that could totally knock you off your game. Right, right, right. Oh, or sorry. Or just infuriates you. And clearly this 14-year-old just became infuriated. <laughs> yeah. No, this is a Halloween prank. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Get no, no, out no. on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, no, we ain't effing joking. Give us your money. So the other one hands a black trash bag to the teller. The teller filled the bag with money, just over $3,000 in total, and gave it back to Thelma and Louise. The girls started heading outside, but Louise stops, takes two steps back into the bank. Is that all of it? She asked the branch manager, like a good little teenage pirate twin. Yes. <laughs> we keep very little money here, the manager responded, somehow keeping a straight face. <laughs> I mean, you're, it's you're a bank. bank. It's a bank, Danielle. <laughs> Can you imagine? Uh, we don't keep it. This isn't yeah. a subway. Yeah. No, we keep very little money here. <laughs> we're a Burger King. We're talking yeah. about a bank. <laughs> I think it's more appropriate to say we keep all the money here. Yeah, yeah exactly. We, actually, we keep all the money here. <laughs> uh, so the twins bolt outside. The getaway driver uh, just reminds you, that's their mom. Yeah, I was about to say, wasn't she supposed to be keeping them safe during all Oh, she's keeping them safe. She had the engine running. And as soon as they jump in, they take off. All right. Absolutely. You have to keep the car warm. You don't want anyone to get too cold. <laughs> That's right. Now, Jack, he wasn't even awake when Ann and the twins left. So imagine his surprise when they show back up with a bag full of pirate's booty. Mm -hmm. This left Jack with a huge moral dilemma. From his own words, quote, what was I supposed to do? Say, here, police, my wife and kids just robbed a bank. My only thought at that time was, what do we do now? I imagine the options he considered, Danielle. Maybe leaving the money somewhere and contacting the bank anonymously, telling them where it was. Maybe contacting the police to return the money directly. Maybe, maybe even using the money to stop the foreclosure and save their home. Do you think he made one of those decisions, Danielle? Based on other decisions he's made, no. Mm -hmm. We're calling this amazing decision number two. Oh, the family grief. all jumped in a car. They stopped somewhere to first pay a $214 phone bill, and then they headed off to Atlantic City. Woohoo! The, the parents gambled at Caesar's Palace while the kids hung out and shopped at Ocean One Mall. <laughs> I knows? had this hope within me. Yeah, yeah. Maybe this is going to turn at some point. And get I off did. It the crazy turn. train. Nope. No. It's it's continuing down those tracks. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, parents gamble, kids shopping. Who knows? Maybe the parents could win back enough money to fix all their problems, stop the foreclosure. Maybe they'd win enough to even pay back the bank that they robbed. But no, none of that happens. What does happen is they finish their fun little vacation. They drive back. Jack realizes that they need to ditch the gun that was used in the robbery. Why? Well. The magazine clip for the gun was missing when the girls got home. There's oh, a good, yeah, good there's a, grief. There's a good chance that uh, they left it back at the bank, Danielle. But there was another very interesting detail about this gun. It was a toy pellet gun that belonged to their little brother. <laughs> Maybe he'll take the rap. The girls, oh my gosh. The girls painted his gun with nail polish to make it look like it was real shiny metal. So Jack stops somewhere. He throws the toy pistol in the trash on the drive home. I know. I mean, first of all, no one got shot, even <laughs> if it wasn't a pellet gun. Like the, what kind of, but the clip being left behind, I guess, you know, you don't want to have anything connected to the actual crime. Now, while the family was having their nice vacation, investigators were hard at work. They had surveillance footage and they quickly identified the girls. They also did find the toy guns magazine clip. One detective would say, quote, 
14-year-old girls steal lipstick, not rob banks. The fact that such young girls, children really, were involved yeah. in such a serious crime does set you back a little. Mm -hmm. The captain, not a pirate captain, but the captain <laughs> of the Barnegat Township Police would say, quote, I have never seen anything like this. Three days later, Danielle, the family was getting ready for dinner when an uninvited SWAT team and FBI agent showed up oh, and they didn't even, happens. they didn't even knock, just bust Dude. in. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think Anne made enough dinner for so many people, but no. the SWAT team was hungry for something else, Danielle. Justice. Yep. There we go. They arrested Jack and Thelma Louise and even their 16 year old stepsister. The police believe that the whole thing was masterminded by the parents and that the older stepsister was supposed to be part of the plan, but she backed out. The FBI also recovered 2,700 of the stolen loot at the home. Now, the initial charges were armed robbery and possession of a weapon for Anne and the twins. Jack was charged with receiving stolen property and hindering apprehension specifically for throwing away the toy gun, which the police actually recovered. I don't know how they found it, but somehow they oh. found the trash can on their drive home and found the, the gun. The parents were given a $75,000 bail, uh, which they Ooh. wouldn't take a 10% cash deal on. Like, you know, usually for bail mm -hmm. amounts, you could get a 10% cash on it. Um, surprisingly, the parents couldn't get that amount of money together and they were sent where yeah. all the pirates go, to the Ocean County Jail. <laughs> the, the twins were sent to the Ocean okay. County Juvenile Shelter. When asked why they did this, Thelma would say, quote, I saw that my family was upset, the money was needed, so I decided to rob a bank. The older stepsister, who was 16 at the time, was charged mm -hmm. with conspiracy and released to the custody of her grandmother. She would wind up pleading guilty and was only sentenced to probation. The prosecutors were originally considering trying the twins as adults, but they, they later changed their position. Yeah, I, I don't know how you would do that. I, yeah. I get the sense of, you know, you scare people with a gun if it's real or not. Yeah. Um, but it would not look good for the city, I think, to be charging 14-year-olds no. as adults. And we're not talking, like, it's not a murder case. It's it's a yeah. little different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the twins do actually plead guilty to armed robbery and they're sentenced to four years in the juvenile facility. They would wind up actually testifying against their stepfather, giving us more Ooh. details about the crime, including that they even prayed before mm -hmm. entering the bank. And their mother apparently did try to talk them out of it. But Thelma told her mother, if you're not coming, I'm still doing it. Luis was a little tough on the stand. The prosecuting lawyer asked if she was upset with him and Luis looked over at her stepfather and said, I'm mad at him and my mom for getting me into this situation. Jack's trial would also bring out some other info. That trip to Atlantic City actually had a bit more of a criminal motive than I originally thought. He was laundering the money there. Changing. I was about to say, there's got to be something up with that. Yeah, which I was wondering about in your story when you mentioned that they were going to Vegas. Because mm -hmm. I had this in my mind about, oh, yep. what a great place to launder money. You just go in and turn cash into chips, go somewhere else, get those chips back out as cash, and you've, you've cleaned it, essentially. Um, so that's part of the intent that they think he was there for. Uh, Louise was also very open with the courts about her mother asking her to lie in court to save both her parents from prosecution. Her mother actually wrote her a letter. And of course, any letter that comes into a facility like that is checked. So they, yeah. they they pulled that out in court. They're like, look, you're asking your daughter to not get her mom and dad in trouble, essentially. Oh, in, that's in sad. Yeah. Good grief. So her mother, Anne, despite the fact that they kind of showed she wasn't exactly on the up and up, she would also wind up testifying in Jack's trial because marital privilege doesn't apply in New Jersey. I never, I didn't know that there was any states where that didn't apply. Yeah. So uh, New Jersey, not a good place to be a pirate or a mobster. Let me just no. put that out right now. Mm -mm. Jack, who was facing 10 charges in all, would wind up with a jury saying he was not guilty of one of the charges, child endangerment, and they went deadlocked on the other nine. The prosecutor vowed to try the case again, but in October of 2003, Jack pled guilty. He said, I just wanted to get this over with. 
my kids have a long life ahead of them without having to see me go through this again. Yeah. He was sentenced to four years. His children were removed from his care and are staying with relatives. Anne pled guilty to armed robbery and using a juvenile to commit a crime. She faced up to 30 years, but was sentenced to 15. While she was very teary-eyed on the stand, the prosecutor felt little remorse for her. He would say that Anne chose the bank, picked out the toy gun, and even cut the eye holes in the nylons that one of the girls used as a mask. Quote, she's not a victim. She's not a bystander. She's the mastermind. Yeah. She used her own children, her own flesh and blood. Mm. She sent them into a federally insured bank with the purpose of robbing it. So Anne winds up with the stiffest sentence of everyone. And clearly the prosecutor thinks that's appropriate. Yeah. So uh, I did look for some updates on this. In 2004, Luis was actually transferred out of the main juvenile facility to kind of a halfway house, you know, mm -hmm. supposed to get her ready for getting back into society. But she wound up breaking out. She literally walked away from the low security facility. She was found, I believe it was just a day later. Mm -hmm. can, can you guess where she was, Daniel? Oh, no. Oh, gosh. Where? Was she at a bank again? Don't Atlantic, tell me she was at a bank. Atlantic City. Oh, good grief. Come on. I know. I know. She was rearrested. And that is the story of the family of pirates. And if you're wondering if they saved the house, nope. It's reported no. that the foreclosure did go through and the house was to be auctioned off, but something happened. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Before I want to thank mm -hmm. the Washington Post, CBS News, Fox News, the Ashbury Park Press, the New York Post, the Globe and Mail, Philly.com, the Intelligencer, Wikipedia, and Pirates Forever for information <laughs> contributing to today's story of the pirate family of Barnegat Bay. So... This story, when I hit that they went to Atlantic City, that's the moment my mind got blown. And I was already writing it. I was already, whoa, this is crazy. We got 14-year-old twins pulling off a bank heist and their mom's the getaway driver. Yeah, what? To hear this other angle about Jack, you know, being, oh, I didn't mm -hmm. know I was sleeping. What do I do? I'm not going to turn my family in. Let's go to Atlantic City. Like my brain just exploded i was just like what is this what is going on here and honestly i saw some other articles about jack where um other another prosecutor that was working on his case was like this guy isn't kind of as nice as as he wants to make it sound yeah he's uh he's someone that's involved with a bunch of other things he's kind of a glory hound he always wants the cameras and all this stuff um so I went looking for the updates on this case, and Danielle, I hit something super, super weird. And I don't even know how to explain it. The first thing is what happens to the house, right? So the mm -hmm. foreclosure goes okay. through. And then in December of 2003, the house burns down. Okay. I, I mean, that sounds fishy, right? It's just That sounds weird. very fishy. Now, the thing is, all the family stuff was already out of it at that point. As you can see. It's so weird. But not only that. So Luis, the 14-year-old, I find an obituary for her in 2010 at the age of 22. And I, I can't tell what happened because you know how obituaries are, are written. Yeah. Then huh. I find an obituary for Jack from 2017. He died at the age of 52. The stepsister in 2019 dies at the age of 33 the what? little the little brother the little brother whose toy gun they stole dies in 2021 at the age of 31 i can't find causes for any of it it's Joy. insane and the whole time i mean honestly one thing i'm thinking is when did that like when did when did ann get out like is this I mean, this seriously, because she's the last one remaining. From... It's, I mean, either she has the worst luck in the world, like literally it, her family has passed away around her. I don't know. It's it's mind blowing. Like and I, I, I've i never That's quite hit anything like that. Like insane, isn't it? So of everyone that we mentioned in that story Anne and one of the 14 year olds, they're the only ones that are still only alive ones. in that family super weird so that was part of you know there's some of them 
some of the siblings yeah. had more kids. And I know that that's part of the reason why I just wanted to keep all the names out of this one. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't want any of that to Oh, that's absolutely wild. Does not sit well. It's it's mind I mean, this story is mind blowing at one level yeah. in terms of what happened and those amazing decisions. Mm. Like it just <laughs> it I, I I it feels like the kids are being taken advantage of. Like I I really hate mm -hmm. that aspect. And Louise yep. is kind of she's the one with the voice of like, hey, they're the ones that put us in this problem. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I don't know. It's just it's really, really heart wrenching. I don't know. I don't know what to make out of it, but it's uh bizarre. Sounds like some Ozark stuff. I don't know if anyone watches Ozark here, but <laughs> my wife <laughs> does. Just like, yeah, yeah. that sounds super weird. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where I feel like after you look into stuff like this for so long, you start to like, yeah, coincidences. Mm. You know, like I mean, when you have that many things pile up like that, it's that. That's I'm like mind blown. Like that's yeah. so strange that these are, they're young. They're too young. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 22, 33, 30 31. Yeah. Like, come on. It's, it's, it's literally unbelievable. Like I was, I rechecked and checked that stuff over and over. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. To make sure you're like, this is real, yeah. right? Like I'm like, this, this is just someone <laughs> with the same name in a different area. Nope. Because, you know, no. also in obituaries, they have like who preceded them in death and who their yep. other family members are everything tied up and you're like wait a minute <laughs> I, I was I, I just blew my mind it's so yeah, that's weird. strange i don't know what to think about that i don't I'm know like scared to theorize <laughs> i know i know i'm like a, i can't think about it too long someone might know <laughs> yeah gives me um a little little halloween creeps for everyone at the seriously end of the episode here i don't know i was about to say i feel like both for stories at the end there's so many more questions than we like first went in with yeah yeah that's weird <clears throat> oh, that was a good one. I know why you were waiting and so excited. Well, I was, I mean, just about the Atlantic City thing, I was it's already, just like, what? yeah, I was yeah. like, oh, I can't wait to tell Danielle that. But then when I hit that thing at the end, I was like, I was, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure to even talk about it or not. If, you know, I'm glad you did. Well, every now yeah. and then you'll run into, oh, one of the main people mm -hmm. passed yeah. away later or they had another criminal charge or, you know, like something like that. And mm -hmm. we don't always bring that in. But that one is just, that's too, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It, and if nothing else, I think it just ties in with this strange, mm -hmm. crazy bad luck or a chain yeah, of grief exactly. that kind of extended through this family. That was another thing. The dates for some of those, like 2017, 2019, and 2021, exactly two years apart from each other for three of those passings. Nope. Don't like it. I know. I know. I don't like that at all. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Oh my well, gosh. as always, and to kind of bring the mood back up, sorry guys, but I just, I had to tell you guys. Oh, about I that. like, no, yeah. I think that was interesting. I'm glad we were able to go into that. Yeah. Um, Danielle, please t tell me about um, something, something silly for an extra okay. story. Let's get into it. All right. Well, unfortunately, this is also going to leave you with questions though. Oh no. <laughs> okay. that. No, but in like a funny way. It's all okay. right. Don't I'll worry. Think. I've got you. So Halloween 2020. All right. Weird year makes sense that there are weird crimes okay mm -hmm. hayes police department in kansas ended up getting a call around 1 24 a.m so we're like deep into the party time of halloween they report to the 500 block of ash street because someone reported a physical disturbance they heard a woman screaming let me go hysterically when police arrived they find the woman they're able to take care of her and they also find the perpetrator who had clearly had way too much fun that halloween night his costume of choice, no costume at all. He was completely naked. <laughs> I believe that's called a birthday suit, Danny. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so as police approached 34-year-old Dustin Kraft, he took off on foot, which I'm sure was just absolutely hilarious to watch. <laughs> While on this naked Maybe escape. Maybe from the front. Well... <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. So while on this naked escape, he kept turning around to frequently threaten the officers. He'd be like, ah, don't come closer. I'll kill you. Like just crazy things until he was finally tased to the ground. Okay, good, good. Good. He ended up being arrested on domestic battery, threats against law enforcement officers, criminal threat, drug possession, and drug paraphernalia. Mm. Wait mm. a minute. Wait. Where, was... Where did they find drugs and drug paraphernalia no. on a naked man? 
No, Danielle. You were supposed to make things better with this story. You made them worse. <laughs> that's, that's, I say that's definitely trick. That is not treat. Exactly. That's a big trick. <laughs> Look what I can pull out of my hat. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm telling you. Oh, wow. Well, you, it, did, you did say it was going to make me think, but yeah. the things I'm thinking are terrible. It is. It's awful. <laughs> but like, but the thing is, is when I found this story, I'm reading it. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just like, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> How does that charge come into play? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're welcome, everyone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't even, I don't even, I don't want to go further down. I'm just, there's all kinds of different paraphernalia. Yep. And now my brain is yep. like, well, it had like, to have it. been. No, it couldn't have been. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then where's the lighter no exactly I don't, I don't. <laughs> see it's Goodness. a rabbit hole man all right well i've got one for us too gainesville florida halloween Never letting us down yeah halloween 2012 a marine was headed to pita pit oh yeah it's apparently like a subway but you can make whatever pita you want can i get one of those mm -hmm. out here please Anyway, it's really good. Mm -hmm. It I've sounds. Yeah. And just that whole idea. I'm like, oh, a subway for pitas? Duh. Yeah. Why don't we have one? Mm -hmm. um, the mm -hmm. Marine walks up and he sees a Halloween costume that sends him over the edge. Uh -oh. Waiting in line at the pita pit is a man dressed up as a U.S. Army veteran, fully uniformed in a wheelchair. Now, the Marine, who was wearing a tutu, but we won't get into that, decided to teach the guy in the wheelchair a lesson. Mm. You don't make fun of Army veterans like that. He hits the guy twice, literally knocking him out of the wheelchair. Only one problem, Danielle. It wasn't a costume. Oh, no. Oh, no. Daniel Priotti is an actual paralyzed U.S. Army vet, and he was just waiting in line for a tasty pita. Quote, I'm totally shocked that somebody would just come up to me and knock me out. The guy's an idiot. It's unbecoming of a Marine. The Marine in the tutu was charged with abuse of the disabled. Okay. I've got so many questions. Why would he immediately just assume... That that's someone in a costume. I mean, I know it's Halloween, but still, like, yeah. why would you? And if I mean, and if you're going to be making an assumption that, like, you know, you don't, you don't run into it full steam ahead and knock someone out of their wheelchair. Yeah, yeah. At least give some warm up of like, hey, jerk, what are you doing? Like, start yeah, a little like, at least conversation. Argue, fight with the guy first. Yeah, like, but yeah. don't physically this. Poor man. Yeah. Oh, I feel so bad. I mean, look, I, I you know, I, I know that stolen valor is a real issue and people work yeah, very absolutely. hard to get those positions and they, they risk a lot and they deserve to be honored. Um, but yeah, have a little conversation before you start swinging, man. That was just, oof. So yeah. Okay. All right. Who's going to win this month? We, we both right. did it. We got through it. We mm. did. We made it through. You guys get to vote. Who told the best Halloween crime story? This is going to be a tough one because I think we both brought it very well. I think so, too. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. You Your can, ending, though. Yeah. Nailed it. <laughs> you can vote on the Twitter account at Crime After Pod for the first seven days after the episode drops or... You can also head to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and you can vote there. We do have a link in the description box below. You can also still click the little letter I. It'll take you there to vote. At Crime After Crime Podcast, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, how to vote for your top three show topics Woo! for the final season, join our Patreon or shop our Teespring store. And as always, a huge, huge thank you to our patrons. You guys, we have so much fun over on Patreon. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly where we talk about all sorts of crazy things. Plus, patrons get a personal shout out and an upcoming Patreon special. All right. To kick off the final season, our next episode is an original. This one suggested by Danielle Hallen. We are going with Craziest Prison Escape. And she's excited. I can see I'm it. ready for it. I can tell. I I'm think she already has it. it researched, as a matter of fact. I, well, it actually did pop into my head because I was researching something totally different. And I did mm -hmm. come across one story and I was like, whoa, I have to tell John. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> awesome. <laughs> so it should be good. I'm yeah. excited. This show is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Hallen, and the wonderful John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And don't forget, go to the website and vote mm-hmm. on your top three topics. We need your help to make sure that this last season is the best. We want to go out with a bang. We need your help for that. Help us. We appreciate it. And we will see you guys next time. Also, please stay safe this Halloween. <laughs> Absolutely. Have don't a, become a part of any of those statistics. <laughs> yeah. Jump a bunch. Get a bunch of fun in there. Get a bunch of candy. Yeah. Leave out the danger and, and crimes. Let's just leave mm-hmm. those behind. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Leave the pirating to me. Bye.